There is no right or wrong. There is no good and evil. There's only balance and coherence within nature systems. The order is actually created by nature itself, and we just have to let go. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, pass down wisdom, and bring the world closer together. This is the Commune Podcast, where each week we explore the ideas and practices that help us live this healthy, connected, and purpose-filled life. Mr. Zach, here we are. So good to be back with you, Jeff. Yeah, uh, I love this. This is becoming a very happy ritual. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. It enriches life. us every time. It does. I always leave think well, there's a lot to think about, <laughs> um, which is a, a good metric of success for me. So, um, so last time uh, we were together here on the property in Topanga, we were uh, cloistered around a crackling fire into the wee hours of the evening and and we started to have kind of a pretty broad metaphysical conversation and I sensed that you were on the cusp of something I couldn't put my finger on it exactly but you know you spoke articulately as always about beauty about the nature of beauty and how how beauty is synonymous or emergent out of coherence. And, uh, and this really got me thinking a lot. And um, I started to uh, excavate uh, cycles and systems of nature that uh, integrate or that emerge within coherence. And, and I thought that um, it would be this a sort of a fun exercise for us to unpack uh, a little bit about the intelligence of nature, and we can kind of back into this a more spiritual notion of beauty. And just to, to have some fun, we'll put it kind of in a somewhat Shakespearean uh, <laughs> setting um, where we can role play a tiny bit uh, like it. just to make it fun because it, it, it is a little bit of biochemistry or a little biology. And, um, and I think people will, I think it will be edifying uh, and there's certainly great allegory that can spring from it, uh, but, but there is some density to it. So just to, to, to set the, to dress the set, um, you will, uh, if you're willing, play the role of, of an apple tree. Oh my, what an honor. I'm and, all uh, in. Uh, well, you should be honored because <laughs> I will just be a hapless uh, homo sapien. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving me the higher life form. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll certainly uh, soon see why you make that comment. Um, and uh, I'll start 93 million miles away uh, in a star that we, we both share called the sun. And in the core of this celestial being, there is a process where um, hydrogen nuclei are, are fusing. And within that process, uh, they're creating helium. And uh, in the wake of that, light energy is emitted. And that goes out in every direction, of course, but um, most notably and aptly for us in our direction. And it enters our Earth's atmosphere as uh, electromagnetic radiation. And this light energy comes down and hits one of your leaves, uh, a chloroplast, let's say, in one of your leaves. And from there, a process is instigated. And I yield my <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah, so, I mean, that Shakespearean, you know, back backing to it, you know, it is this extraordinary dance between, in some ways, the masculine and the feminine there, you know. And so if we think about the solar radiation event that you're describing there, that, that nuclear event that we call the sun, it, the surface temperature there is thousands of degrees, right? And so you've got thousands, thousands of degrees of temperature. It melts anything. There's no no solid anything on, on the sun. Obviously, it's all in a plasma state. That's kind of one could imagine kind of this masculine expression of power, you know, of energy, of energetics, and it's got a very 
finite purpose to it and that it's there to create this light energy this this huge electromagnetic field pulsing out of it until it burns out but it's a finite game all stars end and so uh, we see the march of this finite play through that masculine archetype of energy production if you will but the feminine is so interesting as you kind of move away from that finite game to the infinite game of, of the feminine archetype, which is process-oriented instead of goal-oriented. Mm. And the, the feminine energy that I think is ultimately uh, elicited from that is in the interaction of that masculine finite game into something infinite that we would call life. And so uh, while stars l- come and go, life and the ways in which energy is is manifest or or given into bodies uh, is something that is ongoing throughout the universe all of the time there's certainly life on other planets whether they're extraterrestrial or if you want to believe in intelligence out there or not is regardless there's certainly extraordinary amount of life out in the, in the galaxies a billion stars per galaxy billions of galaxies and so you've got that phenomenon of this capture of this finite game of the star into this infinite game of the march of life. Mm. And in that march of life is this balance between what we would call in the human mind, death and rebirth or death and life, which seems very dichotomous, you know, to that Western mind as you've spoken to. But the reality is it's a, it's a closed loop and there's no waste of, of, or loss of energy anywhere in that system. And so me as the apple tree sitting on this planet, I get to, to do something really beautiful with that that finite masculine energy coming across the solar system and the first thing that interestingly happens is is atmospheric and so before it will reach my leaves that sun uh, begins to warm something for the first time and so it's interesting that just millimeters off the surface of that sun at thousands of degrees is absolute zero Mm -hmm. you're you're near absolute zero it's almost no molecules are moving you're you're so cold uh, you're minus 200 something degrees and so you've got this freezing atmosphere and if you picture you know an, a- an astronaut out there you know who suddenly has a breach of of their you know incredibly protective gear that they're on they're going to freeze to death before they run out of oxygen at the tissue level it's going to be instantaneous that they freeze so this is how cold it is in that vast space between the surface of the sun and our atmosphere yeah. and then it's and the, that belies our intuition right? belies intuition <laughs> we would like to think that the sun is hot yes and <laughs> sunshine is warm but interestingly it's not the sunshine that's warm it's the dance of that sunshine with solid state you know, part, particles that create heat. Mm-hmm. And so as it hits our atmosphere, it creates a warming event that's really the vibrational effect of uh, an excitation from sunlight. But the vibrational result of thermal radiation or thermal heat is more the result of the physical, you know, particle that it's hitting rather than the sunlight itself, the, the beam of electromagnetic frequency coming from the sun. And so that thermal event is native to our planet or native to any solid structure within the vacuum space of of the universe. And so it's beautiful to think that it's actually our Earth warming itself in a lot of ways every day in reaction to a finite dance of the sun. Mm. We have this infinite play of, well, we're going to warm ourselves over and over again. And at the demise of this solar system or this star, the energy cannot stop persisting and the energy will have to go on to warm something else and so as i start to absorb that sunlight into my leaves i can do a dance with that thing at the microbial level and so within my leaves is a vast ecosystem of bacterium that are called plant plastids that live inside of my leaves and as the plant plastids get exposed to that electromagnetic radiation of the sun it excites the chlorophyll within my plant plastids and I will convert that to energy in the form of carbohydrates or fatty acids. And that's basically a process of taking carbon, CO2 primarily, and combining it into a carbon chain. So glucose, a sugar, or a fatty acid are just long chains of carbon. And my plant plastids that are now generating all of that potential energy, I'm basically creating storage, right? We've got a battery system in carbon uh, that I'm now passing on to the space around me. And if no consumer comes along, I'll actually pass that into the earth as my leaves drop at the end of the season. And I will re- restore the mycelial bed within the network of the soil systems through my energy, you know, dropping my leaves into that mycelial bed and passing that sunlight into that incredible intelligence of the soil. 
And so in this way, as this apple comes into play, the apple is an expression of solar energy in its reproductive capacity, which is so fascinating mm -hmm. to me. So to talk about a feminine archetype here is that you're taking this finite, very singular mission of the sun to, to create that hydrogen event that would create that nuclear reaction. And then for that to, to boil back into a life-giving regenerative story of a single tree being able to capture energy, not for the purpose of capturing energy, but for the for the purpose of distributing life itself for reprodu reproduction of life. And so I think this is the infinite game ultimately represented here is that as we start to understand natural systems is we need to shift ourselves into an infinite game of existence as humans. Mm -hmm. For too long, we've been very masculine archetyped in that we're so focused on production of energy, transportation industry, oil and gas, all these things are now the solar fields. And we, we're so fixated on this production of energy as our, our purpose to drive the economies and all of this, we've forgotten its purpose. And perhaps the purpose of any energy sun but born always obviously oil and gas sun wind all of these are the results of solar energy hitting our planet and so it's beautiful to imagine the seeds within this this fruit here really being a promise for the future and as i drop my apples into the soil systems and i get those seeds distributed i'm promising to continue this infinite game a finite game is made uh, really designed for a winner and a loser and the infinite game is produced or designed such that we can all continue to play the game. And that's, I believe, what the feminine archetype of nature is showing us is that when energy is present, we need to transmute that into biodiverse life forms. Mm -hmm. And we need to focus on the capacity for adaptation and biodiversity in everything that we do. And, and the ways in which we apply energy need to be the focus rather than the production of the energy. We need to move out of that sunshine masculine thing of let's produce more energy into how are we going to produce life? How are we going to support biodiversity within the applications and usage of those energies that we may be going after? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot for me to pull on there. I mean, the... The geometry of the masculine mind, I think, as you've alluded to, is very linear. It's like a, uh, it's like you take a, a waffle out of the freezer in the morning and you look at it, it looks like a grid. It's not like holding um, a, uh, like a handful of uh, broccoli sprouts or something, you know, yeah. which is more really what systems actually look like. Uh, in mutually interdependent systems look like a handful of broccoli sprouts. They look like a bush. They look, if you look, take a mycelium network or neurons in the human brain or your microbes in your gut or almost any um, functioning system. I mean, you can even look at like social systems, for yeah. example. Um, it, it's often um, like a bell curve, for example, is often used to represent a healthy society with a thriving middle class. Well, a bell curve is sort of a homely two-dimensional representation of a, of a bush, okay, right, in some ways, or a handful of broccoli sprouts, where you have a town with a local jazz club and a local paper and an independent radio station and a farmer's market, and that's, it, that's bustling. You know, it, it is m completely mutually interdependent in every way. And, um, and, and a more uh, vivid and accurate representation of the systems that nature has inherently built. So, you know, you described the process of photosynthesis and in some ways, I suppose, the purpose of photosynthetic cells, which is to take light energy uh, and use light energy as a uh, catalyzing event with water um, to create and carbon dioxide to create glucose and oxygen. And th this cr creation of energy um, or creation of glucose, which then gets built into more complicated and comprehensive fatty acids and proteins, et cetera, that's used for the structure of your trunk and 
mixed with the genomics of, of, of the seed of the apple to actually create the fruit, but also, as you say, to take these sugars and put them into the soil such that it can feed uh, microorganisms and earthworms and interact with mycelium networks and that aerate the soil and increase water retention and all that juicy stuff that that goes into a healthy ecosystem under the ground. This is also providing hapless old Jeff <laughs> with the opportunity when ghrelin might be released in his stomach um, to the, that would tell my brain that I'm hungry um, to go seek you out. Yeah. And, uh, and there I am wandering uh, you know, in the, in the orchard and conveniently about yay high, <laughs> <laughs> there's an apple, um, uh, designed just perfectly for my personal harvesting. And, um, and as soon as I look at it, uh, I start to salivate even th talking about it and thinking about it with you right now, I already actually have a little bit of saliva in my mouth that has enzymes that are almost digesting it before I actually even bite into it. <laughs> yeah, it's getting ready. And, you're, and you'll have to assist me as I go through this process because you'll you'll certainly uh, find some some error and and misuse of terminology. I'm sure as I try to <laughs> go through how uh, non photosynthetic cells essentially, as part of the carbon cycle, break down glucose and then produce the carbon dioxide. And this is the absolute, like, astounding miracle and coherence and beauty of nature. So I bite into your luscious uh, uh, Zach apple, and, um, and as we talked about, my, the enzymes in my mouth start to break this thing up, and my little epiglottis flops down so I don't take it down my windpipe, and I chew this thing up, and it goes down this tube, um, called my esophagus, and uh, that uh, operates with this process called peristalsis, which essentially is a contraction of these muscles that's pushing it downward. In fact, I challenged my wife, Skylar, to stand on her, to do a handstand and see if peristalsis would still work, <laughs> like it would still take the apple down the esophagus, even if you're doing a handstand. And sure enough, that was the case. It's, it's amazing. Um, and then uh, here we, the, the semi-digested apple enters uh, this repository of my stomach. And, um, and at that point, it, it interacts with other enzymes uh, that break it down, amylases and proteases and a bunch of other aces that I don't know. Pepsin is one, I think, for proteins that I think is, people know. And hydrochloric acid, and it pushes this um, chyme into my, uh, into my small intestine where, uh, the broken down sort of phytonutrients and, and other basic elements like glucose is absorbed into my bloodstream. Now I'll just follow this a moment before we go back to the glycolysis process. Mm -hmm. So then as it continues to go down, my small intestine enters my large intestine where the indigestible fiber of your gorgeous apple um, is then interacts with the, the microbes in my gut. All this bacteria, lactobacillus, and um, start to digest this indigestible fiber, and they start to produce their own postbiotics or metabolites, most notably short-chain fatty acids, of which one the most famous one of which is butyrate, which actually upregulates all sorts of things in your body, among them insulin. So if we go back to the glucose being uh, absorbed through the wall of the small intestine into the bloodstream, it gets picked up by insulin, uh, which made by the pancreas, its job is to take the glucose to the cell for energy production. And it goes through this absolutely mind-numbing process of, of glycolysis, which I started to try to understand, but essentially it's a 10-part it's a process by which glucose is eventually um, uh, transmuted into acetyl-CoA and um, that readies the mitochondria um, to create and produce ATP, um, the primary 
energy. Well, well, one of the primary energy mm-hmm. sources of of the cell, and then sort of concomitant or concurrently with that process, um, oxygen, which is obviously taken in through your generosity, um, is comes into my lungs and into through my alveoli and my picked up by my hemoglobin, pumped out um, with my heart to all my extremities and um, it interacts with pyruvic acid to create NAD, which essentially is this electron transport system that scoops up all of these extra electrons and brings them to the mitochondria. And this is where it gets a little hazy for me, to be quite honest with you. Um, it, for the process of, um, within this greater process of cell respiration for energy production. And of course, the transcendent byproduct of this whole experience is carbon dioxide and water. Um, and this is the absolute majesty and beauty of the carbon cycle, um, which is just an, a, a very complicated and nuanced, yet very um, clear reflection of our mutual interdependence of the beauty that has just simply emerged. Like we didn't make it, we didn't put it there, we didn't construct it. It simply evolved and emerged through this fundamental transcendent intelligence of the universe. And uh, there's no straight lines on top of it. There's no grid. <laughs> and so this, over the last month since, or two months since we were together, has been one of these cycles, one of these systems. Now, of course, you can zoom out and talk about carbon in general here because uh, of, of some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings that we have about carbon. But on a greater more metaphysical level, um, since that conversation, this has, these have been some of the thoughts pinging through my mind of what are these systems that emerge in utter beauty and coherence? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, it's a great review of that re- release of the, the battery energy that my plant plastids would have put together. And so the plant plastid is a mitochondria that lives in plants instead of animals. Mm-hmm. Um, but the mitochondria living in any you know animal form, whether it be earthworm or human, the mitochondria are there to basically reverse engineer the, the carbon battery, right? And so you've got that carbon chain of a fatty acid or glucose both treated exactly the same it turns out like the the right. conversion everything you described from acetyl coa down is all happening inside the mitochondria so glucose hits the surface of mitochondria it is converted to acyl coa then acetyl coa in two enzyme steps and a free fatty acid coming in to hit that mitochondrial uptake is going to go through the exact same two processes to turn into acetyl coa so all this discussion about is fat or carbide better, is mitochondria are literally doing the same thing with both. Um, and to them, it's just acetyl-CoA. Like the, the mitochondria are, are now have that small carbon unit ready for processing to release the, the light energy. And so while ATP is the last step in, in respiratory physiology as far as the biology side of that, the energetics or the quantum physics side of that is released to the electrons. And so really what I'm doing when I digest, you know, this apple or you digest the apple is you are re-releasing that ra- radiation event. The electron energy from the sun is being re-released within your cells. And it's so much light energy that you have to have a massive fiber optic system to manage the transit of all this light energy through the body. And it's the coherence of the waveforms of that light that are going to coordinate the regenerative feminine archetype of life within you. And so as you develop more and more robust populations of mitochondria, you will find yourself capable of huge regenerative, you know, capacity. And, you know, watching you just over the last eight weeks, as soon as I saw you, I was like, Jeff has completely changed his physiology. Like you have radically changed who you are expressing genetically. 
uh, you, you're expressing a different body than you had just eight weeks ago. That's a radical demonstration of this feminine archetype of regeneration, redesign, creative destruction, rebuilding, all of that happening within the system because the mitochondria are releasing all of that electron energy, all that light energy. The fiber optic system between the cells are called gap junctions, and they are, are bundles of fiber optic cables that you know, can be in the thousands or ten thousands in a single bundle, and there may be multiple bundles connecting one cell to its neighbors. And each of those fiber optic cables, which are, you know, hundreds of times smaller than a human hair, are perfect tubules with a perfectly designed aperture at the end of each. And so just like the aperture on a camera lens, that that light energy can be diffused through to neighboring cells under a highly regulated system that we don't even understand. We have no idea what's controlling the light aperture on a single end of a f single fiber within a bundle of 10,000 cables connecting you know, your, your adjacent cells. So it's just like an engineering feat that's so difficult to imagine. And yet the point being is that if we have enough gap junction connection to all of the neighboring cells, you will continue to rebuild a new body. If it, you start to be exposed to chemicals that will start to break those tight junction and gap junctions so that you can no longer pass light from one to the other, then you get disease. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually described some of your experience with inflammation in the past in a space of chronic inflammation where they, we're losing the cell-cell connection and we're starting to get into this degenerative vicious cycle. We've lost enough cellular communication to do stem cell reactivation and, you know, a hip should be able to repair itself all the time if all the cells are in communication. But with enough, you know, toxin in the environment, and you mentioned one that is so common is the NSAIDs. Yeah. NSAIDs break those gap junctions. And so non anti-inflammatories or prednisone as a steroid, these break the, the gap junctions. So does alcohol, so does glyphosate and Roundup, which are so common in our food system. So that all of these are breaking the light energy transit or, and losing coherence. And as soon as you lose coherence at the cell level, we've shown this in our lab over and over again, it doesn't matter if it's a gut or a blood-brain barrier or capillary or kidney tubule, all, right. all the cells start to go into precancerous format. And so they start to look like fibroblasts. They lose their, their plasma volume in seconds. And so you see happening on the microscope in split seconds what is traditionally understood to take, you know, 17 years to develop a cancer, blah, blah, blah. It can really begin in seconds if you break all those gap junctions. And so unfortunately, this cancer epidemic that we're currently in, one in two males in the United States now diagnosed with cancer before they die, that level of cancer burden is speaking to an environment that's breaking our ability to transit the sunshine through our cells by that re-release that you're going to be working on. So we're literally, I think, dimming the lights of humanity with the chemical dependence in our food systems and our, you know, our alcohol and traditional you know, celebratory acts that are always poisoning these systems. Yeah. So we're literally putting the lights out on our species as we create these environments around us that are so toxic to our ability to translate that solar energy from plant plastic in the tree to the apple to your mitochondria and re-release that feminine archetype, we're breaking that all apart and we're playing a f very finite game of, of life and death right now as humanity because we've forgotten this you know, deep connection to the cycles, right? And you yeah. spoke to the carbon cycle, but there's a water cycle, there's certainly hydrogen cycles, there's nutrient cycles within our bodies that would really define our vitality and survival as a species. Yeah, and it's, uh, and of course, when unimpeded, these cycles work to almost perfection. But uh, we continue to introduce external agents that seem to, as you say, whether it's <clears throat> toxins or glyphosate that seems to be uh, loosening those tight junctions, whether they're in the endothelial of the vascular system or the epithelial of the, of the gut lining, um, it, it almost doesn't matter. It's just that they're breaking down the integrity that a lot, that, that nature has created for these systems to function. And it is really um, a, um, an amazing oversight and a sort of a lack of gratitude on some level. There's this Hafiz poem, um, even after all of this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, the sun always gives, you know, it knows nothing but love. 
It never thrusts the requirements of its ego onto anybody. It asks for nothing in return. And in a way, that is what, like, capital L love is. It's a state of being that knows only giving, that is only interested in investing in the welfare of another. Um, of course, there's transactional love and conditional love, but this is, you know, this is love outside of, uh, of any emotion or that might be arising and subsiding in consciousness at, at any moment. And, I, I, you know, you've talked really eloquently about this inflection point where we find ourselves, where, you know, there are a number of directions that we can go. And, um, and I'll, um, I'll just outline another brief example of coherence, because I think it could be a springboard for a conversation on how we move forward and, uh, and with what intention. So I don't know if you're familiar with the history of the wolves in Yellowstone. This mm -hmm. is a sort of taken on mythic proportion. But in short, in the early 1900s, there was an extirpation. That's such a mean word. You know, just the word, the sound of the word is mean, um, uh, of the wolves. Um, and, uh, and they were hunted and killed, and they disappeared from Yellowstone Park, one of our great national parks. And, um, <clears throat> and we essentially mucked with nature. And the af in the aftermath of the decimation of the wolf population, um, the elk effloresced, and they came down from the graded areas of the, uh, of the range, and they came into the prairies, and they ate all the grasslands and all of the other flora, and the deciduous trees started to disappear, and the willow started to retract, and the... Um, and the banks of the river started to erode, and we lost all of this biodiversity. Um, but of course, the elk, they flourished. And it, it took, there was all sorts of issues, or all sorts of efforts to try to unwind this desiccation of the land um, that became barren and fallow and, you know, just not pretty either. And eventually, um, there was a scientist that, uh, that convinced the, the National Wildlife Refuge, I think it was, to um, go capture some wolves in uh, Canada and I believe some other Idaho and bring them into Yellowstone. And when the wolves were reintroduced, of course, we saw nature come back into eubiosis. The elk, many, many of the elk were killed. But they also went back up into the graded areas, as the coyotes did too. And the grasslands reemerged, and the willows started to grow back, and um, this keystone species, the beavers, started to become active again, and they were building all of these dams that were creating these marshlands for the bears and the moose and, you know, creating pools of cold water so new fish were coming back. And, like, and you know, it, it doesn't... You know, anyone can look at that, uh, that example and understand that when unimpeded, nature finds its perfect balance. But, but when it's nature, humans say, that's beautiful. You know, we're never concerned about the elk. You know, we're never say, oh, but what about the elk? But if the elk were human, then it is seemingly instinctual for us to overlay some kind of morality on that. And we veer away from the innate coherence and eubiosis there, and we start to say, no, like that is morally wrong. You know, we shouldn't be, we need all humans to thrive, to, to have 
opportunity for well-being. For so this has really caused a lot of honestly tumult in my own brain, as you can probably tell. Um, of you know where living in accordance to nature, where finding coherence and beauty. In some ways, we need to recalibrate how we think about right and wrong. I think you're spot on. I think that uh, the hubris that's in that homo sapien, you know, kind of self-identity, and we called ourselves wise twice, right? Homo sapiens sapiens. Yeah. So, you know, we have this hubris built into our, the, the title we've given ourselves uh, because we looked around the planet and said, well, clearly we're the most intelligent species here. We're the most adaptive. We can go into any ecosystem. We can met out a living and survival and in the most vast varieties of ecosystems and regions throughout the world, we can harness, you know, nature to produce energy and do all kinds of things. So, uh, so we started in that hubris mindset. But I, I think it's worthwhile noting that in indigenous cultures, that that hubris wasn't really there in the same right. way, right? And so, I think it's very much a Western phenomenon, and certainly other pockets in Eastern world too. But it's a very masculine archetype for sure that unfolded in human history for the colonial kind of expression of extraction and you know persecution of certainly other humans but also nature itself in our march towards empire building and the like and so with that kind of hubris of colonial worlds for thousands and thousands of years we keep expressing this masculine archetype the feminine archetype <clears throat> The feminine archetype, in contrast, is one of understanding that there is no right or wrong. There is no good and evil. There's only balance and coherence within nature systems. And so I just got back from the Achuar tribe a few months ago in, in the Amazon. This is in the southern part of Ecuador, right along the Peruvian border, the sacred headwaters of the whole Amazon basin. Uh, this area of river systems ultimately becomes the Amazon River. It feeds you know, a canopy of trees that's larger than twice the size of India. It's just it's such a vast forest you can't even wrap your head around it. I had been reading and studying you know concepts around the Amazon water cycles for decades, and then when I got to fly over it in these little bush plains and land deep in the jungle, it just just boggles the mind. You cannot tolerate the scale of what you're seeing because the human mind doesn't have any reference points to to really guide you into the experience that this thing keeps going for, you know, a, a coverage of, of trees that is larger than the United States. So you're going through that experience and then you land in that space and the Achuar and many of the other tribes in that area have a 40,000 year oral history, which is similar to the Aboriginal uh, history in, in Australia. And up until the 1980s, they were warring tribes and they were notorious for being pretty brutal on one another. The, the infamous kind of head shrinking and all of this that was being done is kind of this magical aspect of warfare and all of this that was uh, being expressed in these communities. And the way that they ex describe that experience is that every couple decades, the the blood of war rises in the, in the masculine format of the tribes and they go to war for a period of time and they battle over hunting grounds and they battle out sometimes over nothing more than expressing this this energy of war and it, you know ultimately that kept them in balance with their ecosystem for 40,000 years and so while war and killing each other with machetes seems like a horrific act and okay. what happened in the 1970s was a a catholic priest i think it was maybe he's episcopal um, he, instead of going over to, you know, help them, you know, he, he didn't touch the Ochoar at that time, but a number of the other tribes around that area, uh, the Ochoar didn't come into t contact until 1994, and they reached out actively for contact uh, because of their dream work. And, but what they expressed was this rise of war kept them in balance, and then this you know, pastor comes along or, or clergy, and instead of indoctrinating them to something else, he actually indoctrinated himself to the Achuar or, or the um, tribe that he was with. Mm -hmm. And so he became fully engrossed in their culture and in their thing and, and their way of life, their food, their lifestyle for years and developed trust with them. And then slowly changed the mindset there that maybe war is good or bad. 
Yeah. And interestingly, as soon as that happened, you start to see the phenomenons of population growth and challenging of loss of you know food autonomy, and you start to see the system starting to break down. So somewhat like the wolves and that and right. and all of this is yes, the wolves and the caribou or the wolves and the elk. It's human to human. There was a natural selection for life and its balance with life and death being this this you know kind of maternal instinct and uh, that's really brutal for the western mind to wrap its head around as it just doesn't compute on a lot of levels and so is the answer to go back killing each other i think not i think we've actually gotten to this point where we can actually see that there's many other ways to regulate human population and it comes down to really education of women if we educate women and give them opportunity to create uh, within their own environment to their own autonomy and independence, then this family size so suddenly shrinks from six to seven down to two. Yeah. And so I think we're getting to a point of maturation as a species where we can look beyond, you know, violent forms of, of that life and death and, and good and bad kind of balance to this uh, realization of uh, energy is continuous. And if we give freedom of, of access to the energy that we would call communication or education or any of these things, we're going to find a new new form of continuity or coherence as a species that we've lacked in the past. Uh, our exploding population, you know, today 7.8 billion, something like that. It didn't go down at all, by the way, with this pandemic story. Like the population is still rising at exactly the same rate as it has in years past. So so the, the belief that this pandemic somehow impacted human population on some sort of gross level is, is inaccurate. And so we still are growing at that same rate because in the end, we haven't found that balance. We've continued to write ourselves out of nature. And that's actually the, the Oxford English Dictionary, or uh, the, the definition of nature is everything under the firmament of, of, of the planet, including you know rocks, minerals, animals, plant life, as opposed to humans or anything humans created. And so we right. literally put ourselves in opposition with that humanity uh, and nature. And for that, we have not found our balance with natural systems on the planet. And we continue to be extractive and destructive. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to have these conversations, honestly, in the Western world, because they, uh, they quickly, there's a slippery slope between talking about balance and then like eugenics or mass exterminations or stuff. And that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at really is we, we do need to have these candid conversations because the world cannot exist as flat where you have 8 billion, 10 billion, 12 billion humans, but it's not just 12 billion humans. It's a hundred billion chickens, pigs, and cows, and no other animals. Yep. <laughs> so the world becomes this flat plane with this spikes at the end. And in any, you look at that, those systems, those kind of siloed imbalance systems, and they never work. Yep. It's always when there's a bush, sorry to come back to your name <laughs> as a metaphor all the time, but it's always when there is something thick and bushy in the middle. Um, this kind of notion of the bell curve. And, you know, some of it, I think, is tied to this Western mindset that's partially Judeo-Christian and partially Enlightenment-based science, that the world is created or the world is constructed, and it can be understood in its component parts. So like in the Judeo-Christian tradition, you know, some imaginary, uh, invisible yet bearded guy with a Merlin's cap and a robe built a ceramic figurine and blew, like literally created it and blew life in through its nostril. You know, that's the mythology there at least. And that God made, created the earth. And that, that has been the dominant paradigm in Western Judeo-Christian thought. It's that the earth is something that is created. Now, science comes along, well, science kind of moves along with that process the whole time from Greek antiquity, but really comes into its full efflorescence during the Enlightenment, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, death can be explained, and all of these other kinds of things, and, um, and it perpetuates this same idea, but in a, with a different construct. It's not revelatory anymore. It's, 
it's empirical, but it's still the notion that the world is basically like a TV and we can take all the different tubes and the knobs apart and we can put it back together. And that's how humanity and nature and the earth functions. And this is very, very different than what I might call a more feminine or a more Eastern conception of how the world exists, where systems simply emerge and evolve in concert with each other. They're not created by anything or anyone. And, um, and this is where um, like the traditions of Taoism and Confucianism kind of rely on, on that basic principle that, that, that humanity, nature, the totality of the universe is an organism. It's not a house. And it can't be patched up the way you patch a roof on the house. Mm-hmm. And we see that over and over again with, in, our, in our allopathic medic- medical system, where we try to patch deficiencies or illness in the body like we patch a, a leaky roof, <laughs> where, we, where we just address a symptom, and then the symptom causes some other symptom, and then we address that, and, and then we address that. So I wonder, you know, I, I've never made the connection between kind of a more Eastern vision of the world and a feminine version of the world, but it seems like that's a little bit of what you're getting at. Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it comes down to balance, right? So the Achuar tribe started dreaming dreams of the, the destruction of themselves and their forest and all of humanity and back in the 1980s, 90s. And so they started dreaming Westerners into their reality. And so they were inserting dreams into Westerners' minds until they were found. And um, they reached out to very few specific individuals that have continued to work with them down there since contact in 94. Um, The most prominent group of those is is the Pachamama Alliance with Glenn Twist and Bill Twist there. And the interesting prophecy that kind of aligns with the reason they reached out was because they recognized that this unbalanced masculine version of humanity uh, was the result of just the masculine wing beating on the bird of humanity. And so it's been in circles, it's been in spirals, Mm -hmm. and unfortunately spiraling down very quickly now as, as we continue to deplete the life force of life on the planet. And so now we're really in this destructive, vicious cycle. But their prophecy was that in this time, between you know the the nineties and and today, we would start to see the feminine wing start to unfold for humanity, and for the first time, that bird would, would fly straight, and we would create a completely different society. And so, when we start to think about the feminine archetype, the feminine wing, if you will, of that yeah. bird of humanity, we have to move from this finite game to the infinite game of life itself, and start to understand life going far beyond humanity, and to shift from that you know, the planet was made by God for humans to understand that the planet was made by, you know, the intelligence of nature, whether we call it God or whatnot, f- to include humans. Yes. And that that simple shift will take us out of the finite game into the infinite of like, oh, my God, if we start to embrace the genetics of the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we find out that we're in the midst of the biggest scientific revolution in time because we are suddenly realizing that the human cell does not sit at the center of human health yeah that's so Huge. dislodging to yeah. the hubris <laughs> of humankind that it's actually an it's seemingly insignificant and invisible microbiome that sits at the center of human yeah. existence that's just so hard to wrap your head around and yet it's absolutely the truth and so we have to replace this this hubris with an understanding of us within life and the Course of Miracles, you know, kind of as a, a, a new expression of, of that Judeo-Christian mindset, um, says, you know, through a vast book there and everything else, an amazing amount of coursework that's been developed over the last 25 years. But the last kind of concept or sentence in that, that system is that the last thing I will do in this human body is to give up judgment. Mm-hmm. And that's a beautiful concept Same. right there. At the end of the day, we will start to win the game. When we give up judgment and that's what you were talking about earlier we're so in this right or wrong good or evil mindset and you spoke of the yin yang earlier before we started but the yin yang being that example of the mix of lightness and darkness and that that system is beautifully stated i don't know if you want to go into detail on that format but yeah i mean there is as part of all phenomenon just naturally emerging there is a coincidence of opposites mm-hmm there is life and death 
and male and female and beauty and ugliness and right and wrong and left and right and up and down and back and forth. And these concepts cannot even exist without the other concept because there is no up. Try to build a world in which everything is up. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> tell me how that goes. Um, and that there is um, in a emergence of opposites that nature will find the order and the balance between these opposites. So if you look at the symbol of the yin-yang, um, which dates, I think, back to 1200, 1300 BC in China, I know it initially kind of was associated with the I Ching, which was a book of and system of divination, um, and then was carried forth as a symbol in Confucianism and Taoism. But this is not a... Uh, a rectangle. This is not a square or a cube on purpose. You know, this is not a vertical. This is not a straight line. This is not rank on rank crops. I mean, you can, this is not a grid of New York City. This is not a waffle. <laughs> this is a circle. And within uh, the circle is the acknowledgement of the, natu uh, the natural emergence of opposites. You have the white and the black that represent all of the different opposites that might arise in the world. But as you notice, again, it's not a square, it's a circle. And it's not a straight line down the middle of the circle. I actually have one on my chest, <laughs> which for the people that watch the video part of this, maybe they'll get to see it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> actually, as an aside, Skylar and I got either side of the yin-yang when we were 17 years old. Um, <laughs> So, see, we were so foolish then to only realize how intelligent we were. <laughs> but there's no straight line down the middle of the yin-yang. It's an S-curve. Because even at the moment where there is the least amount of life, there is a tiny bit of death. Or the, or the greatest amount of death, there's a tiny bit of life. And even on the other side of the yin-yang, part of the other side exists. So there's the dot that exists in the fat part of the, the circle on the other side, knowing that, that this is the condition, the precondition for everything, for existence. And now there are different uh, philosophies. I mean, Confucianism was basically a, a philosophy or a, a, a liturgy of, of rituals that made it incumbent upon man to create order out of this chaos of opposites. You know, so there were family rituals and rituals between the warrior class and the, and the servant class and um, et cetera. Um, it, essentially, there was a concept in Chinese philosophy called qian, qian and, uh, which was a sort of heaven, not with like a godhead per se, but sort of an idealized version of the world, uh, which then it was incumbent upon man to realize that idealized version of the world here on earth. And that was Confucianism. And uh, Lao Tzu, who was an administrator in the Zhou uh, dynasty that was ending right around this time, 400, 500 BC, when these philosophies were, were being developed, he was not interested in society. He was sort of a hippie. He was always depicted in this long white beard. It was actually, there's a fable that said he was actually born with a white beard, uh, which is, I think is hilarious. And, um, and, but he represented older people in some ways who were, became disentangled with society. They weren't concerned with the world of the 10,000 things or the no, and they removed themselves and came to a realization that the order is actually created by nature itself. And we just have to let go. We have to practice what is called wu wei, sort of non-action, and just let go. Let go of judgment, be humble, and surrender in some ways. Stop always forcing and he, he said in the Tao, you know how you make people untrustworthy? You distrust them. <laughs> so these were, 
the Tao, in a way, is a logos. It's sort of a, hmm, a sort of a fundamental intelligence of the world, of the universe, such as these things will balance. And I think you know the yin yang is a, uh, it's sort of hackneyed, you know, in our iconography of, of spirituality. But I think it speaks very much to what you talk about, um, which is not the straight lines that Western culture seems to be keen on imposing all the time. Yeah, it's that loss of judgment. It's that you know ultimate surrender to a higher intelligence that you know brings us through every religion, you know, towards a spiritual reality of letting go of uh, the boxes we put around those things, you know, and starting to allow ourselves to merge from this history of needing to believe that we had the right path to spirituality, you know, needing to believe that our religion was better than somebody else's, you know? yeah. <laughs> instead of realizing that we are all, you know, light beings that are striving to come into coherence with the deeper intelligence within the, the system of the universe. And so we are striving to come into coherence with that highest intelligence, that most complete data bank within the universe, which I would argue is a, really a vibrational reality. There's a vibrational coherence in the universe that's it physically expressed in black holes and their connection through wormholes, every black hole being connected to one another. And the transmitted mission of information between the black holes is extraordinary. You know, so you've got every electron in space and time since the origins of the universe are being actively processed through the proton of every single atom within every single you know physical structure within the universe, and the and that proton ends up being the same structure as a black hole in the center of our galaxy. And so trippy to understand that you have billions of billions of protons in every single cell mm. and then you multiply that by 70 trillion and then you multiply that again by the hundreds of trillions of you know microbes and mitochondria and everything else like the amount of of galactic information in the black holes of the protons that are contained within a single human body defies logic you know we're, we're at truly an astrological scale uh, fractal of that in a single human body and we're communicating through our black hole physiology of the proton to all of the other, you know, galactic for, you know black holes out there. Stephen Hawkins, you know, famously you know, developed or was first to measure the information coming out of black holes. They're called Hawkins particles. He held for a long time that that was just chaotic, you know, unorganized information. Uh, but in the end, it's really played out that it is actually organized information and it's kind of the data bank of all physical existence since the origin of the universe is being transmitted and communicated and remembered and in fact integrated in the black holes of the universe and within my own body and the atomic structure of my protons and as i spent time with the achwar i got to experience that coming close to their energy coming close to the energy of that rainforest uh, going through some of their nutritional cleansing and you know ceremony and everything else i got to drop into that that galactic reality of the black hole and i was in this you know for six hours in this grid and got to see the energy of the universe being transmitted you know at extreme speeds through my physical body and my ability as a physical body to reorganize that energy to not just you know build life but actually to realize that energy being infinite in the universe is all information and all of that information is for the purpose of connection and those three premises is what I walked away from that whole jungle experience. Energy is infinite. All in energy is information. And all information is for the purpose of connection. Mm -hmm. And so with that deep knowingness now, I think I came as close as I ever have to seeing God. I understand now that, that what we've termed God and we've given all kinds of human form to and human myths and everything else, what we really are dealing with is an organized intelligence within the universe whose intention seems to be for life and to create it in its most vast adaptive capacity for the most biodiverse expression of beauty. Mm. Okay, that is interesting um, and beautiful. And I and because and this is important because of course. We do use a lot of terms to describe this ineffable effervescent force, right? And of course, you and I have a, a kind of rapport that we could use the word God and, and know what we mean. But of course, 
when most people use that word God, at least in the United States or in the Western world, they're talking about a monarchical Godhead who is uh, maintaining like a eight billion moral abacai and, and registering everyone's transgressions with a sexual regulatory manual or something <laughs> as if to determine their eventual eternal fate. Now, this is not how you and I think about God. And, um, but because we, um, because we are trying to define this logos, um, and we're trying to use our clumsy vocabulary to do it, you know, this is the great challenge of, of our, of, of forever. I mean, if there's, uh, two things that we seem to have a hard time figuring out. It's what we should put in our mouth and what the hell God is, <laughs> even though we have hundreds of thousands or even millions of years of experience to try to get at it. And, uh, and I think, you know, so this is, I think, interesting definitional work um, so that God is, can you, can you reiterate mm -hmm energy, information, connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that energy is is organized and in, remembered and integrated through a grid-like structure of, of the universe. And it, it's, it was shockingly linear because I'm so fascinated by non-linear systems in nature. I always assume there's nothing there. Hmm. Um, I, any linear system I wouldn't have believed in until I dropped into that space. And what was happening as I fell through that grid for hours, I was at high speed transit through this grid system. And what what's happening in that space is that the there's a fluidity of the linear structure that creates flow and nonlinear motion and nonlinear expression of energy. And so the grid is composed of these cubes you, you could picture and at it, corner of each cube is what looks like a, a liquid ball of metal that holds a small bar to to form the edge of the cube yeah. and then you stack you know an infinite number of those cubes in every direction and the interesting thing that i experienced is that the bars that would form the the edges of the cubes would can pop to other angles within the cube and so that there's no need for all of the edges of the cube to be defined in any moment. Instead, the bars will flip across to adjacent uh, corners to create nonlinear flow of the energy through it. So while the geometry of the universe is extremely rigid, it's extremely predictable. And we know that by the explosions in, of stars when they create supernova. Uh, those supernovas obey a massively intelligent mathematical expression they they at light years in diameter they're following geometric intelligence and they're expressing themselves geometrically with perfect math mm -hmm. and so even the explosion of plasma in the vacuum space of the universe there's perfect math being followed and so what i think i experienced is just this this reality of the rigid structure underneath the the quantum physics of our nature was designed so that it is always predictable outcome in regards to its capacity to move energy but it was very agnostic to how that energy would ultimately flow through the grid system to express itself. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we have a lot of evidence in the biology of our planet's history, four billion years, that at every single moment of that transmission of sun onto the surface of this planet, that's de developed the capacity for vitality of life energy to be transmuted and re-muted and retransmuted. All of those patterns have always pushed for adaptation and biodiversification, as I've said. Mm -hmm. And it does that through the feminine infinite game of energy is infinite. All energy is for the form of communication or is a form of information. And that information is, is for the purpose of connection, which means that uh, there is ultimately a solution to destructive nature, which is communication. And so uh, while there's the potential for destruction and creative destruction at every part of the carbon cycle, at every part of the water cycle, there's creative destruction happening. It is creative. It's not destructive in the, in the pure form of an extractive, finite game. It's an mm -hmm. infinite game of, of destruction and regeneration. 
And so as we're starting to think through these cycles and we start to think about the fabric of the universe and the extraordinary ability of black holes to communicate across great distances and the ability for those to transmit information into our own bodies, we're starting to get at how do we think? How, how do we have consciousness? And it's basically that we've developed a biology that can interface with that grid of the quantum world to structure information and to use that information for the purpose of connection. So we created great societies. And, you know, you social, I think, is the name of the book. That's a great one. It looks at you social communities in, in biology. And it's an interesting concept where this, I can't remember the name of the author there, but um, he writes on the number of species that really diversified across the planet and have survived every you know, recent epoch of, of destruction on the planet. And they include termites, ants, mm -hmm. and ultimately humans. And so the resilience of termites and ants and humans comes down to this eusocial quality where that he finds in each of those populations an altruism uh, that's not in the altruism of, of the Western mind. It's actually um, a service to something greater than self and instead of an expression of you know, generosity, which I think right. is the Western mind's approach to. Right. It's not about generosity. It's like that son that never thinks about giving. Right. And so we have this incredible flow of... of of information out of you know the bees or the uh, the ant kingdom and everything else that there's a s certain segment of the society that's whole purpose is to serve something greater than self right and we can look at humans and say maybe that's our clergy historically maybe not I don't know but maybe that's you know our nurses maybe it's our midwives who who knows who that has been but we do have this this tendency as a species to think greater than ourselves. And I believe that's ultimately why we've risen to a great space of biologic, you know, captivation of energy on this planet is because we have the capacity to interface with this higher intelligence of the universe itself. So when we talk about consciousness, there is no thing called consciousness. It's, it's literally a lens that you're looking through at an infinite field of knowledge and information in this infinite grid of energy. And so consciousness is the lens at which you look through an infinite you know, connection to everything that's ever been remembered, integrated, and, and the rest, yeah. which fle frees me up as a human being from thinking I need to know anything or learn anything. Right. And this is the brilliance of Confucianism and so many other things. Is it's that letting go of, it's letting go of your judgment, it's letting go of your your beliefs of what's right or wrong, it's letting go of your sense of dominion. And it's starting to see yourself as an expression of something far greater than yourself. Yes. And that's where my joy has really taken off this year. Yeah. It's so interesting to hear you describe the grid because it immediately um, connected uh, an image. Um, there's an, an image known as Indra's Net. Um, I'll send it to you, but anybody can, can Google it. And it was the way that the Buddha saw the world when he had his awakening under the fig tree, which became hmm. the Bodhi tree. And it is almost exactly how you describe hmm. your grid, which is that life exists um, not as, a, you know, some linear kind of uh, artifice, but as a net. So as you can imagine, a net. And in the corner of each net, uh, of each... Um, intersection. Intersection is a um is a water droplet oh my gosh this gives me goosebumps i know and within the water droplet it reflects all of the other intersections of that net mm -hmm. and of course this was part of the buddha's awakening where he went from like a vidya which A is non and vidya, video, sight, non sight, or ignorance, or what you're ignoring, um, to um, nirvana. So the recognition that we are, that we exist within Indra's net. Um, and the Buddha talked about it as a acknowledgement of mutual interdependence as wise understanding, but a slow process, what he called the Eightfold Noble Path, that resulted in um, samadhi. And samadhi could be best described as nothing that you know. Um, 
It can only be described as a sensation, because that's the best word that we have for it, that there is no delineation between the experience of what it is like to be you and all of phenomenon that arises, that there is no difference between you and experience, that you are experience. And this was, um, I guess, understood as integrated consciousness, that yes, there is a sort of idea of Cartesian um, subjectivity that Zach has five senses, and so do I. You're a person now. You're no longer an apple tree. I've <laughs> re you. released you from your arboreal state. Um, that you have five senses, and science is genius to enhance those senses, and that you're using those senses to perceive objects and sight and smells and sounds arising and subsiding in consciousness moment to moment. And that informs some experience of what it is like to be Zach. And there's some experience of what it is like to be Jeff. If I was naked, if I wasn't called Jeff, if I wasn't having a podcast, all of these things, there would be some sort of subjective experience of what it is like to be me. But sitting, but I get confused between that and my ego. We'll save that for another podcast. But behind this notion of subjective consciousness, there is what the Buddha might refer to as integrated consciousness of an absolute sensation of living within Indra's net. And that might have been somewhat of the sensation that you felt within the grid. It fits beautifully. And water structure, obviously, is kind of the physical expression of that quantum world on the planet. You know, the water is mm -hmm. certainly the most fascinating quantum molecule we have on this planet. And it has, uh, like the black hole on in the physics side, the water is this expression of that on the biology side. So the water does hold the memory, uh, does hold and integrate the information that we might expose it to through emotion, through intellect, through you know, connection to that knowledge field, through our consciousness. Uh, we store all of that information in our water structure. And our water structure is super interesting. It's, it's crystalline in the cells. Uh, it's not a liquid. And mm -hmm. so we are drinking you know, all this tea and water all day long, thinking we're hydrating. And certainly it's still in a liquid state when it's in our bloodstream. But as soon as it transits into a cell, it transforms itself into a gel-like solid state that's crystalline in structure. And that crystal structure holds light energy that's pulsing out of the mitochondria that are you know, burgeoning within that cell. And there's 200 mitochondria per human cell when we're young. Right. It diminishes over time. There's 2,000 mitochondria per neuron. Like it's just a vast amount of this microbiology within our cells. It's you know, 14 quadrillion mitochondria inside a human body. 14 it's trillion? Quadrillion. Quadrillion. 14 quadrillion. Yeah, so it's just so vast, you know, it's 100x the, the number of human cells, you know. And so you're you're this vast, vast number of mitochondria that are pulsing out of this light energy from the sun, and it's immediately passing through my crystal structure of water inside the cell. And the crystals in there look a lot like the crystal and function as the crystals would in a, an old, you know, radio. All of our original radios were crystal-based, you know. And that crystal would vibrate at a certain fr frequency, and therefore we could transmit information at a frequency, and that crystal would pick it up, and you'd hear an FM station or whatever it is. And so that crystal within our cells and that water structure is vibrating to light energy from the sun being exposed to my uh, genetic in intelligence within the mitochondria and within the human nucleus. And that water interacting with my DNA creates an antenna. And mm. so the, the, the wind of a DNA strand, double helix, cannot do a double helix unless there's water attached to each nucleotide. And that water molecule creates the bend and it creates the stability of the DNA strand. And importantly, it's the memory bank of everything that genome has ever done. And so the water structure that you're describing in the net is definitely the biologic expression of the quantum physics world that might have been what I was describing there in, yeah. in quantum space. And in both situations, be either the net or the grid, we have nonlinear expression of beauty through a linear grid, you mm. know. Yeah. And I think that's the balance, that's the yin-yang of this masculine and feminine archetype. The masculine is certainly the grid. The feminine is the flow of energy through the grid. And so it's interesting to start to utilize that structure for reimagining human ingenuity and activities. 
And we've done that in my company, Seraphic Group. So we have a for-profit you know, innovation hub. We have lots of subsidiaries that we've developed looking for root cause solutions for all of the existential threats that we have on the planet. And we decided at the very beginning, actually by a, a subconscious mandate from a woman who walked into my clinic in 2010, she said, it looks like you're going to run out of money soon. I was like two, two <laughs> weeks in and I was like, I'm already out of money. And she's like, well, I can help get a line of credit from a bank, which I had never heard of because I'd never started a company. I can get you a line of credit, but you have to promise me that you're going to found all of your companies in a feminine archetype. I, was, I needed money more than I need, needed to know what feminine archetype was. I said, that sounds good. I'll hire as many women as I can. Um, and then went home that night uh, to read up on the feminine archetype, and it changed everything. So for the last 12 years, I've built building you know, a relatively robust, you know, mid-sized company now uh, with hundreds of people working around the country and the world uh, on these projects. And it's fascinating to see the impact of understanding the necessity for the finite masculine structure within corporations, but you only understand that as necessary in its ability to move the feminine energy through it. Yeah. And so the creative energy, the the infinite possibilities that flow through that masculine grid is the expression of nature, is the expression ultimately of beauty. And so we really have worked hard to have a corporation that doesn't ever go running around with quarterly tr projections and you know yeah. sales mandates and all of that instead we're we're basically surrendering to the possibility of being in the infinite game as a corporation a corporation that could exist in 500 years you know far beyond my lifespan is going to take and, and necessitate the balance of the masculine and the feminine the finite games within the infinite game the finite plays within that infinite game and so as you start to reimagine energy systems and the like we've done this and so early, we're launching our energy company uh, with our full, first full scale plan out in colorado in the, in the first quarter and we're really excited because basically we've built a 40-foot mitochondria and are taking carbon from all kinds of waste streams because it's not waste it's carbon chains so right. plastics tires yeah, farm whatever, waste yeah. it's all just carbon chains and mitochondria are so good at breaking those carbon chains down into co2 so they can be recycled into green plants around the world and so we're taking something like bio waste from from you know bagasse which is sugar cane which is one of the biggest problems globally um, but hemp cane being close second now in the united states we're, we're off gassing so much methane into the into the atmosphere because of piling up uh, hemp cane that's slow to compost um, so we got all this waste product, quote unquote, because it, we're taking it out of the biologic cycle. And so we can make out of that vast amounts of biodiesel and ultimately biochar for soil remediation. So we can close the loop between Man. CO2 in the atmosphere and soil usage of carbon at the mycelial level to re reconnect because we can re reverse we can reverse global warming immediately at least our our impact on it uh, by just reconnecting this carbon cycle and so our fuel company is really focused on how do we just marry back all of these you know fictitious waste streams to see them as massive resources of energy that are just not being you know obtained or or used right now and it's going to be a whole new multi-trillion dollar industry out there built around reconnecting carbon cycles which is a much different story than carbon sequestration and you know, stop emissions and all that. Like, it's not too much CO2 in the atmosphere. It's a breakdown in the connection of that CO2 to the plants that we continue yeah. to kill, to the soil that we continue to kill. 97% of our soils on the planet now either severely depleted or depleted. Uh, we, we've lost all of our arable land and it's not breathing. And therefore, that CO2 is not ending up back on in the food that you're consuming. The food you're consuming is lower in energy in so many ways than the food that would have been produced, you know, thousands of years ago. And so it's exciting to me that, you know, these innovations that we can make in business are simply expressions of nature. And That's it's it. by studying that, that system of the feminine masculine balance and that ultimate coherence of energy systems and understanding that, you know, a carbon cycle from, from farm waste to biodiesel that would power your vehicle, it's interesting to remember that all energy is information. And so we got to stop thinking of coal and oil as just, you know, carbon sources of energy and start to ask, what's the information in there? Yeah. What is nature trying to tell us through the oil, through the coal, through the sunshine, through the wind? And so we, we need to look holistically at the information within these energy systems and we'll make different decisions. One of the most devastating things that we saw down there in the Amazon rainforest right now is not the oil and gas industry, it's the wind energy is destroying the Amazon right now because China has bought up 
all of the balsa wood rights throughout the Amazon and is building huge highway systems, destroying jungles to mine all of the balsa wood out of out of the Amazon to build the windmills for wind energy. And so this is our this is our falsehood is that we keep thinking of energy as a thing instead mm -hmm. of a, a, a stream of information. And so what is it that we can learn from the information within the wind, within the sun, within the, the, the oil and gas? What are we going to learn within that when we start to listen to the resonance in there? Because there's information there. Mm -hmm. And if that information is happening, it is for the purpose of connection. Maybe it's to connect you to your neighbor when you, you know, drive to your grandmother's house or whatever it is. And so we need to remember energy as a stream of information for the purpose of connection. And it will help us rethink not just carbon loops, but also social loops and design of cities, design of transportation, all of this. If, if everything is an expression of energy and that energy is an expression of universal intelligence and its purposes for connection, are we acting correctly? Right. And if we look at Instagram and Facebook and all these mechanisms of you know, extraction of Google, you know, we're, we're monetizing human curiosity through, through Google. You know, these are systems that are inherently not in touch with the information within the energy they consume. And I would argue that very strongly with cryptocurrency. That is a system that is energy intensive, that is out of touch with the natural design within these systems. And so we're working on currency as well, like what does currency look like within natural design and things like that. So it's very fun because you kind of have, feel like you have a superpower once you start to really understand this balance of the feminine archetype and this phenomenon of energy as information is connection, you start to design everything within fluid motion, within connections of cycles and all of this. And we're going to design a different internet. We're going to design you know, a different currency for global world if we will all cooperate towards the infinite game. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think one point that I want to underscore about all the work that you're doing is that leveraging the intelligence of nature does not mean going backwards to a hunter-gatherer society per se. It is, means harvesting indigenous wisdom and combining it with innovation, with technology to create systems that are in greater alignment and in greater balance. And I, I think people have, a, I think there is confusion around that often is that people that talk about regenerative agriculture or, uh, um, or any, to be honest, any issue, particularly across uh, environment, you know, everyone assumes like, oh, well, they're going back in time to, you know, where the whole world was essentially, you know, pre-industrial world. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot of intelligence to be leveraged there, but it seems like the projects that you're undertaking are capturing some of that wisdom, but they're not forsaking um, innovation. I think, we, I mean, there has to be innovation. It's, it is the expression of nature. Nature is profoundly innovative, right? Yeah. And you look at that last extinction event 55 million years ago, the world never struggled back to dinosaurs, which I find fascinating because I think they're pretty rad. And if I was Mother Nature, yeah. I'd be kind of interested to see those guys return. My daughters think I'm a dinosaur. Oh, so well, there, there you go. go. <laughs> maybe maybe a few still exist. I'm glad for that. <laughs> You're one of my favorite it. dinosaurs for sure. I'm carrying yeah, the torch but, with uh, dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that journey, you know, of nature is so innovative that instead of ferns and, you know, the the reptiles, we end up with you know, the bird world, and we end up with ultimately mammals and ultimately humans. Uh, we are expressing this, but on the other side, we developed deciduous trees. The apple tree itself didn't exist before that you know, last extinction right. event. So the deciduous tree to flowering plants and wildflowers, you know, it's just like that was the result of total destruction. And so we lost 95%, 97% of life on earth, and it came back with an explosion of innovation, diversity, and it's because of the way in which that happens is through the virome, interestingly. Viruses are the expression of, of ingenuity. Uh, they are the expression of adaptation of nature. And so we got to see a whole new genetic potential on the planet for the stress level of that extinction. So, yeah, so I've always wondered this. So uh, there was some catastrophic event, an asteroid most likely, um, that created sort of a nuclear winter-like effect that essentially blocked the energy-producing uh, penetration of, of the sun. Um, and, and then there was a great era of decomposition in which uh, fungi played a significant part. But what 
uh, were there species that actually made it through? Oh, the, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And a lot of them are incredible plant life. Certainly all the ferns, uh, you know, made it through right. because of the spore capacities. The spores are far more stable than seeds. Mm. And so because the ferns communicated through spore uh, structure, they, they survived that, that, you know, event because the spores could stay dormant in layers of dust for eons, you know. Mm. And so the ferns certainly survived. Um, if you go in, in you know, the, the most fascinating two forests I've been in are the arguably the oldest one on the planet is the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. Um, it's older than the Amazon. It's an ancient, ancient uh, terrain. And the life forms you see there as far as the, the plant life diversity and all that are starting to wane now, but it is still staggering uh, just how beautiful that nature was and how vast it was in its creativity. Um, and then the other one being you know, just outside of Melbourne, Australia, another uh, uh, there, I think it's the Sherman Forest, I think it's called there, but um, outside of Melbourne, same thing where you can see, you know, trees that are, you know, hundreds of millions of years in development long before the last extinction event. And and they're fascinating trees because they're actually ferns, but they're a variant of fern that has this huge trunk and, you know, has this canopy that looks like a palm tree. It's It's fascinating. And so... Uh, a lot survived, you know, that when we say there was only, you know, three to five percent of life left, that's still a lot of life given the amount of biodiversity that existed at that time. Yeah. And we we know that the soil systems probably still have not recovered to to that pre-extinction of area because when our lab were studying the communication network between microbes and how they interact with human cells and all that. And we, we have to pull that intelligence out of the soil from 60 million years ago, predating that last extinction because the soils were destroyed in that event. And then you lost the plant life and all that. And like you said, lost the photosynthetic capacity for life. And so that happened. Uh, acidified the oceans because when the earth, soil can't breathe, CO2 and methane and, and nitrogen sources preserve in the air and the ocean starts to absorb those. And the ocean can only handle a couple gigatons compared to the thousands of gigatons that were you know, happening on a daily basis then and are now happening again because of our destructive you know, capacity on soil systems the ocean starts to acidify. It, it, and so we were in this weird balance of, you know, destruction on, on both land and soil following that astrological event. Now we're the cataclysmic event on the planet, you know, happening to do the same thing, kill yeah. this topsoil, do this destruction of photosynthetic capacity, all of that. But, you know, the, the good news is we can reverse it so quickly. When we sit on a farm, you know, it only takes one season to radically change the biologic activity within soil systems. Yeah. I mean, I see it just in my own soil system of my body um, that in a very short period of time, you know, you can completely re redesign your your gut flora um, and uh, and upregulate all of your systems. And it really speaks to this idea that, you know, we do think when we wake up in the morning, we were joking about this earlier, since I seem to be growing an inch long hair out of my ear every day. <laughs> um, you know, you wake up in the morning with some sort of psychological continuity, or I would say psychological and physical continuity that sort of anchors the sense of who you are, of my identity. I'm Jeff because I look pretty much the same as I did yesterday. And I still believe all the same things and I have all the same memories. Hence, there's a stable self crouching somewhere behind my eyes. <laughs> um, but this is a great illusion, of course. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the hair growing out of my ear seems to prove it. But there's so much going on every day inside of my body and inside of everybody's body that we don't see. You know, there's billion. Well, so what is it? Forty trillion bacteria in our gut and in our mouths and in our nose and on our skin. How many of those are recycling on a daily basis? I mean, it's got to be the entire population, you know, over and over again, every three days or so. Yeah, and so, we turn over the entire gut lining. All the human epithelial cells turn over every three days. So yeah, yeah, and and that's hundreds of billions. And so you, you, the speed of regeneration and destruction is staggering. And you age immediately if you stop that cycle, if you disrupt the regenerative repair. And that's what we see with the pharmaceutical industry doing all the time. Yeah. As we say, oh, there's blood pressure, we need to block that. Or right. there's you know, cholesterol in the blood vessel, we need to block that. Instead of seeing it as cycles that are starting to break down or miscommunication happening at the cellular level, we come in with these reductionist belief systems and disrupt cycles. Yeah, or patching through. the roof again. Yeah. It's all of a sudden, oh, well, you know, take a statin. And, you know, because your LDL is too high, 
oh, now you're not producing any testosterone, <laughs> and so your sperm counts are down. Oh, now you're not making any uh, adrenaline, which I believe is made out of cholesterol in your adrenal glands or ep epinephrine. So, you know, we continue to then layer on top. And, um, and of course, this is our great, uh, our great challenge that, uh, that you're on the front lines of, and I'm just... Uh, feel like I'm on a wakeboard <laughs> holding on. Um, but well, happy to I, be I there. think you're pushing the envelope and, and you know, ultimately all this energy we've transacted today is, uh, you know, witnessing information being organized in two human beings, you know, and it's, it's ultimately a real lesson in that, that last piece of connection. Without this kind of connection, I don't know what I'm actually, you know, experiencing or thinking, if you want to use that word. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know about my own uniqueness until I sit across from you or another human being. <laughs> and it's for that that we are enriched, you know. And ultimately, you know, my belief is probably needs to be proved out still, but it makes a lot of sense is that that unique DNA strand that you have, which is 99.99% identical to mine, but that slight difference in the way that the water lines up on yours creates a different antenna crystal structure of the water in your cells such that as the sunlight of the universe you know, pours into you and is expressed through your cellular metabolism, it's resonating at, it, it's, you're attuned to Jeff. Mm -hmm. So you actually resonate to a slightly different frequency than I do. And this is why if we take an organ and try to transmute it into somebody else, it's, it's, it's chronically rejected yeah. Yeah. because it's not vibrating at the same force. And so we can use immunosuppressants so that the immune system doesn't kick in and all that. But still, that, that organ ages quickly and ultimately dies because it's not really an immune issue solely. It's a really an issue of, of lack of resonance within the greater organism. Um, and so I'm intrigued by the possibility that your self-identity is this amazing you know, di dynamic between the physics of the grid and through electromagnetic field transit of your body and this water expression on earth, you know, and, and the water expression within biology in that fourth phase crystalline structure of water inside your cells. And you're tuned to, to, to you. And mm -hmm. I, I find that beautiful. And so when we sit next to each other, it's, I think it'd be smart if we imagine the opportunity, well, we just picked a new station and I'm going to listen to Jeff because I'm going to get to hear his expression of reality that we live in, and it's going to give me a, a new insight into where we are, who we are, and why we're here. Yes. And just to compound on that, if I were the note G, which is a lovely note I in and it. of itself, but as a singular individual note G, I'm not really going anywhere. My direction, my dynamism, my vibrancy is only defined when I add another note to me. Mm -hmm. So if I add the note D, well, that's a perfect fifth. And we are in some kind of frequency resonance there. But if I add, you know, B flat, well, that's a minor third. And that's still, there's still a good, interesting ratio that exists there between the B flat and the G. But it has its own valence to it. And I mean, obviously, in, in, it's been described as sad. Mm -hmm. um, and, but of course, this is uh, when we're talking about living within a holobiont. It's like we are living in connection with all the notes on the piano board and billions of others. And this is where I think it, it becomes really beautiful and interesting because a G can be major and it can be minor depending on who it's in relationship with. And, uh, and I think this is why these kinds of conversations are so important. And it's so important to be sitting around the dinner table with your family or with friends in communion. And you can say, what kind of chord, what kind of harmony are we going to make here? Are we going to make, you know, a seventh with a flat nine and a 13? And that's kind of a dominant chord and it feels like it's going somewhere. Or tonight, are we just going to have a kind of a major seven with a nine and just, ah. And this is, uh, this is truly the beauty of, of connection. And it really is what makes life meaningful because just sitting as a G unto myself 
there is no joy in that. It's just not going anywhere. Well, I'll be your perfect fifth anytime. <laughs> you are my perfect fifth. <laughs> I love you, brother. I love you. It's been awesome to be with you. It's always moving and mind expanding to hear the discussion. So thank you for having me back. Yeah, thank you. To be continued. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this interview from the Commune Podcast, then I think you'll love this video right here. And if you want to get more weekly content from Commune, you can subscribe right here on our YouTube channel or find the Commune Podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jeff Krasno, and I am here for you.